All right, why don't we get started? Um, welcome everyone to the third in our series of case studies in neurocritical care AI. Um, we are glad to have some of you back. And I see, especially there's some people who are um, joining us quite late from Europe on a Friday night. So we appreciate you joining us um, today. Um, we have a, a great um, a great speaker, and I will get into that in a minute. Um, um, just real quickly, you know, why are we why are we doing these? I know for you know for decades, Moberg um, ICU solutions, Moberg Research, um, and now Moberg Analytics has been in the business of um, helping um, clinicians under better understand brain in injury and to um, you know, better manage um, their their patients, and so the you know we've kind of evolved from integrating devices um, to now focusing on the data. And we want you know our goal is to get that data into the hands of amazing clinicians and researchers and scientists like all of you. Um, and so this webinar series was an idea we had just to kind of try to start to close that loop. Um, you know, not a lot of you know, to try to help people um, get get more value out of all this data that we're that we're starting to collect, and we're starting to see huge trials like Boost Three collecting thousand you know a thousand patients, and so it's you know amazing source of data, and that you know and then to to use that data requires some some skill. So we the this this um, these webinars are designed to try to help you um, get get that understanding. It's a big undertaking. Um, you know, learning, um, learning the new skills needed to understand and analyze that data and make sense of it. Um, you know, we're building tools um, that, you know, the goal of which is to try to help you do that. And this webinar, webinar series is just another, um, you know, another thing we're doing to try to help, um, to try to help advance the, the practice. Um, we're doing that through these webinar series now. And next year, we're probably, we're going to be starting um, some small grants, kind of in-kind support of cloud tools and guidance to get studies off the ground. So look for that. We'll be announcing it in the, in the, in the Neuroscience Monitor newsletter. Um, so, Sessions one and two um, were an introduction to a lot of the um, data tools and techniques that Dr. Ed Kim um, provided for us, and he's an amazing instructor. Um, and so we were we were honored to have him um, kind of give us that foundation. Um, today we're going to go into the into the clinical trial space, um, and we're going to talk about um, the Boost studies. And we're going to do a little bit on um, some visualization, just kind of some basic Python, pandas, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, we have one more um, webinar on December 15th this year, and then we'll be announcing 2024 dates um, shortly. Um, housekeeping, uh, we're in the Zoom webinar forum format, so please use the Q&A feature to, to pose questions to the speakers. Um, and also to let you know, I think you heard the, the little blurb at the beginning, it's being recorded and we will make the recording available by the website. So today um, we are really thrilled and honored to have Dr. Ramon diaz Arstia, um, who is the Presidential Professor of Neurology and Director of Clinical uh, TBI Research at Penn Medicine. Um, he is has an extensive um, track record in clinical research. He led the, he leads the TBI research at Penn, and he was um, a, a PI on Boost 2, um, which was the precursor to the now running Boost 3, this huge multi-center trial that's studying ICP and PBTO2 um, treatments, and he also led track TBI. Um, he's got over 25 years of experience um, treating patients with TBI, uh, hundreds of papers and you know dozens and dozens of book chapters. Anytime there's uh, anytime the NIH or DoD or NAM wants um, you know an expert to serve on a committee or a panel, um, they reach out to they reach out to Ramon and he's often recruited for those. On a personal note, Ramon's been a great supporter of of the comp the Moberg companies, starting with Moberg 
research way back when and through Moberg ICU Solutions and now Moberg Analytics. Um, I met Ramon probably in 2017, 2018, back when Boost 3 was just being, I think, just getting the go-ahead to go. Um, and Ramon, having been through sneaker net and CD shuffling of data for Boost 2, knew that um, that would not suffice for Boost 3. He gave us the chance to work with him and build the cloud infrastructure to take all that data and... Um, get it up into the cloud and deliver it back to the study participants. So we were really happy and um, thankful to have that opportunity. Um, and uh, with that, I guess I'm going to stop sharing and Ramon, turn it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Craig, for a really very nice introduction. Let's see, can I share my screen? It says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. So you oh, lovely. Where is I'll that? to share my screen. Ethan, where is that? I changed it. You did. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, we see here. Uh, good. So I can now share my screen. Good. Can you guys see it? Yes. Okay, well, I prepared some slides. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, you know, again, thanks so much, Greg, for for inviting me, and thank thanks to Dick Moberg and and everybody who's worked with him really for the last. Uh, gosh, uh, I started working with Dick probably way back around 2005, so we're going on 20 years. And you know, obviously, Dick and everybody who works with him, but includes Craig and Ethan, and a terrific team of people, have really have the passion for for taking care of these patients with severe TBI and, and, and other uh, severe neurological insults and, and, and improving the care and, and developing engineering solutions to help us do that. So, so this is what the, the an, a typical ICU bed for one of our patients with very severe TBI looks like. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, monitors, uh, tubes going in and out of the, the, the head, going in and out of the body, multiple drips going in, it's a very, very data rich situation. And unfortunately, we are in not very good shape in, in order to, to understand all this data. Because what we want to do in the neuro ICU is to detect paroxysmal, unpredictable events that are associated with secondary brain injury and detect them early so we can quickly deliver the right therapy at the right time. And in order to do that, uh, we, we've, we've made a lot of progress, but we clearly need, I mean, if there's a, a field in medicine that can benefit more from uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning tools, I, I really don't know what it is. So this is kind of what I'm going to talk about very quickly. You know, what do we want to detect? What are these paroxysmal neurologic events that are associated with secondary brain injury? Well, for a long time, it, we've been focused and elevated into cranial pressure. I think that is probably... Um, a, a little narrow, or I think we should be focused on other things as well. Brain tissue hypoxia obviously is the goal of boost, uh, but it, it's clearly important as well to focus on looking at non-convulsive seizures and then cortical spreading depolarizations. I think the work of Jed Hardings and Brandon Foreman and others, I think we're now understanding that these are also important common paroxysmal neurologic events that are associated with secondary brain injury that we need to detect. And there are also some strategies for doing non-invasive monitoring because I think all of us know that although these things are going on in the patients with the most severe brain injuries where one can justify doing invasive monitoring, it's very likely that some of this is happening as well in, in other cases. And uh, this can be using electroencephalography or near infrared spectroscopy. So let's start with intracranial hypertension. I think we've been recording this for a long time, right? This has been, in, in a sense, the sort of foundational technology uh, justifying neurocritical care. And historically, what, what we would do is the nurse once an hour would record on the bedside flowchart what the intracranial pressure was at that point, right? They would hold the sedation. Uh, I mean, they, they, they would do whatever they, they, they needed to do uh, and, and record a number for ICP. But as we started monitoring intracranial pressure continuously, and this is really where, uh, you know, the, the Moberg CNS monitor fur became really useful, we have realized that ICP is a highly dynamic 
uh, uh, parameter, right? It is, you know, constantly going up and down spontaneously in some cases, hard to figure out why, right? And, and really, unless we're monitoring ICP continuously, right? If we were to go back only once an hour, you know, there is a lot that we would miss uh, that is uh, that, that, that needs to be treated, et cetera. I mean, I think, as you know, there has been a lot of efforts to, there, there have been trials directed at ICP monitoring, which unfortunately uh, have, have, have not confirmed that strategies based on ICP monitoring uh, results in improved outcome. There's a great deal of equipoise in this issue. Um, the issue is that ICP lowering strategies became widely adopted, at least in the developed world, uh, before we had any definitive proof that ICP-directed therapy could improve in, in, in outcomes. And, and clearly, monitoring ICP doesn't lead to, to good or bad outcomes. It's what you do with the data, right? And, and I think we need to know what we do with the data. I think, obviously, one of the things that we have been focused on really for many years now is brain tissue hypoxia. Uh, pathologic evidence clearly shows that uh, in lethal traumatic brain injury, people that die from a traumatic brain injury, ischemia, evidenced by pycnotic neurons is, is, is universal. And that is likely a consequence of the microvascular pathology that's very common and that's been very well established uh, pathologically for a long time. So there is diffuse microthrombosis, diffuse stretching and shearing of the, of the blood vessels, which leads to uh, uh, deficits in neurovascular reactivity and presumptive brain tissue hypoxia. If it's been possible to monitor, at least in a very focal way, it's been possible to monitor brain tissue hypoxia since at least November of 2000. Now, the problem with this technology, which is what we are, are studying in Boost, is that it measures brain tissue oxygen in a very focal manner, although we, we are assuming that a very focal measure is, is reflecting something that is happening in the brain more broadly. That may or may not be a valid assumption, but nonetheless, it's the assumption that we have. Now, for reasons that are uh, you know, somewhat not, not totally clear, there has been very variable penetration of brain tissue monitoring, brain tissue hypoxia monitoring technology. There's some ICUs that do it routinely, you know, as we do at Penn and many others that are that are involved in Boost, but there are many others who, who don't. I mean, when this technology was first developed back when I was at uh, Parkland Hospital in UT Southwestern in Dallas, the residents would call this a random number generator. And, and this is a reason why you can see that, right? The brain tissue uh, oxygen number is also highly dynamic, right? It goes up and down for reasons that we don't completely understand. And it was said, well, this is not a random number generator. This is actually reflecting actual brain tissue hypoxia. And unless we're monitoring continuously and unless we have tools to promptly recognize these episodes and treat them appropriately, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. This is the design of the Boost 2 study, right? We were continuous monitoring. And what we measured was the, in red, the total amount of time that the brain tissue oxygen from this very focal measurement dipped below 20 and also the area under the curve, as it were, or in this case, the area over the curve in yellow, right? This is the product of time time, uh, and the, the uh, uh, millimeters of mercury. And we were very gratified, and obviously it was published several years ago, I think most of you are familiar with this work, that patients who were randomized, this was the first randomized controlled trial using this uh, technology, patients who were randomized to a management strategy that was informed by the uh, partial pressure of oxygen as well as the ICP really had much, much lower cumulative burden of uh, brain tissue hypoxia, right? In red, this is the group that was randomized to ICP only. Uh, in, in blue, we have the group that was randomized to ICP and PBO2. We didn't completely eliminate it, right? There was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20% or so of people that had refractory brain tissue hypoxia, that regardless of the management interventions, they still were hypoxic, a substantial burden of the time, but it was greatly reduced from the folks where ICP was monitored only. And I think we we saw that, and, and the study was powered to the biomarker, the biomarker of brain tissue hypoxia. I think we clearly met the primary endpoint, which meaning that, that we could easily demonstrate that there was a potent effect uh, a, over a three to four fold effect on the biomarker. And that was reflected 
And this was not statistically significant because this is not what the study was powered to detect. It was associated with an improvement in neurologic outcomes, reduction in death of roughly 10%. And that was associated not with an increase in, in poor neurologic recovery, but actually was, was associated with a roughly equivalent improvement in good neurologic recovery. So we were very excited about this, which was why we went on to launch the Boost 3 study and we obtained funding from the NINDS. This study is, is still ongoing. Uh, we are, as of last week, we're approximately halfway through with the study. We are now at, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of uh, you know, over 550 participants that have been enrolled in the study. The study is going very well. I suspect many of the sites, at least in North America, uh, that, that you know of, and, and we're really very pleased to work with Lori Shutter, Bill Barson, Sharon Yates, and, and really the terrific Siren uh, uh, Neurologic Emergency Trials Network. Now let's move on to non-convulsive seizures, which is yet another type of paroxysmal neurologic event that is quite common. Uh, I think we all know this. this is an EEG, and I think you can tell this patient who had a severe TBI that there's already some kind of slowing here in the right frontal area. And over time, the pattern there changes and it evolves into the spiky pattern, which becomes rhythmic and then stops, right? So this particular patient was having these events, uh, you know, multiple times every hour. And this is a non-convulsive seizure, which we knew for a long time. Now, more recently, and this was initially pioneered at Columbia, but other centers have been doing it, including our center here at Penn, uh, we, we are using intracranial EEG, and this can be done either through a depth, a mini depth, or it can also be done by a strip. And the latter is usually done in cases where the patient has required a craniectomy. And, and the, the bottom line is that if one does that, we realize that we're missing a lot of seizures on the scalp EEG, right? There are a lot of situations where the scalp EEG is really not very impressive and there's clearly epileptic form activity. And in fact, when the seizure occurs, scalp EEG even pseudo normalizes. So this is a big issue, right? You know, what, what does this mean? How, how much do we need to chase these seizures? I think this is a very active area of, of research and investigation right now. But I wanna show this as an example. I borrowed this from uh, my, my colleague, Stefan Mayer. Stefan and I were residents together a long, long time ago. Uh, and, and I think what we want to show in this particular case is that, you know, there's a lot of different monitoring, of, you know, arterial pressure, cerebral perfusion pressure, intracranial pressure, brain temperature, cerebral blood flow, brain tissue oxygen, then tidal CO2. And it's really the EEG in this particular case, right? When the EEG got hooked up here, when the tech finally came in, we realized that these dips in the partial pressure of oxygen, these dips in brain tissue these, these events of brain tissue hypoxia were associated with seizures, were associated with these increases in EG power. And when the patient was started, loaded with Keppra and Keppra got to a substantial level, the seizure stopped. That normalized the brain tissue oxygen that also had a beneficial effect on, on that normalizing the ICP. So I think this is giving you a sense of the very complex and rich data that needs to be interpreted by a human being and unfortunately, human beings sometimes do, do not have the, the cognitive bandwidth to, to fully organize this. So this is why we need uh, more sophisticated tools. And it, it, you know, maybe the seizures are not the only thing that we need. This is an important paper published several years ago showing that uh, really interictal epileptiform activity, peri uh, periodic discharges that do not rise to the frequency of, of what we would call a seizure, nonetheless are associated with hypermetabolism and increased glucose uptake. And as a consequence, perhaps something that actually has a, a consequence. And that's what this is shown. The final uh, spreading, I mean, the, the, the final paroxysmal neurologic event uh, that, that is quite important in patients with TBI as well as other acquired uh, brain injuries are cortical spreading depolarizations. And I saw that that this is the topic of an upcoming webinar, so I won't talk too much about this, but this is generally detected by a strip electrode. It turns out with a depth electrode, you can sometimes uh, get a good sense as well when CSDs are going on, but these are actually quite common and they are associated with outcome. It doesn't occur in everybody, but they occur in you know probably be, uh, between 40 and 50% of people with, with severe TBI, particularly if they are isoelectric 
spreading depolarizations, which are the ones that appear to be most dangerous. Obviously, EEG can be helpful for non-invasive monitoring, and this is an example from uh, the, the Mass General investigators. Eric Grossenthal was first author on this paper using EEG to detect the late cerebral ischemia after aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I think a study that we're very interested in doing here at Penn is using near-infrared spectroscopy as a tool, a non-invasive tool, to identify these episodes of brain tissue hypoxia. And uh, the, the particular near-infrared uh, technique that we're using is called diffuse correlation spectroscopy, which not only gives you an absorption spectrum, uh, of, of hemoglobin and also gives you a sense of what the cerebral blood flow is. So uh, in conclusion, I hope that I have convinced you uh, that uh, the detection of these transient paroxysmal episodes associated with secondary neural injury is the goal of neurocritical care uh, because the goal is to detect these, prevent them, treat them when they occur, treat them quickly, develop the right therapy at the right time. Uh, the, the right therapy at the wrong time, it, it could, could actually, it, it's not the right therapy. It could actually be making things worse. I think we, we made a lot of progress with invasive monitors. I think non-invasive monitoring is something that we're going to need in the future. And certainly much, much work remains to be done on algorithmic strategies to facilitate real-world implementation. And this is where Dick and Craig and, and the other group the other folks there at Mobrick Analytics uh, are, are in the lead and I think are going to be very, very helpful to us. So uh, thank you guys so much for your attention. Craig, do we have some time for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if anybody has questions, you can either uh, raise your hand or post them in the Q&A um, or we can take you off on mute. Okay, I'm not sure there are any questions. All right, well, Craig, I think you can share my email. Oh, right, there's, I think we've oh, got there's at least one question. Okay. I think, we, I think we had a hand that went up. No? Okay, well, someone got shy. If you want to type it in the Q&A, um, that's great, too. Um, all right, well, we can, um, we can go on to um, some of the some of the visualization work that we've been doing with Ramon. Um, go back to sharing. Um, so one of the first projects we um, did was um, Ramon was gracious. Oh, we got it. Now we have to have someone in Q and A. Sorry. Um, so um, so um, Tony's asking, um, could we revisit the slide? I'll stop sharing. Um, showing the DCS data. Sure. Uh, I will share again. Sure. Mm -hmm. We have plenty of time. Um, so. Okay. That's a discussion would be great. Uh, let me see. Is it this slide? Uh, let me go and hold one second. I'm going to take Tony off the lead. Okay, Tony, you're off mute. Can you're... you? Can yep. you hear me? Yes. We great. Can. Uh, it was actually, I'm really interested in what you're saying about DCS, and I know Penn have done a huge amount of work for this going back some time. Um, how are you finding sort of signal to noise in terms of um, sort of continuous CBF monitoring? Uh, because that basically, I think that's what we're seeing, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's, I, I agreed, agreed. And and let me say, I think I think it's still fairly early days in this technology, right? The DCS instrument that we use was uh, manufactured by Arjun Yod, who's a professor of chemistry here at Penn. You know, it's the size of a of sort of an apartment refrigerator, which we <laughs> yeah. 
and 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 it basically requires a technician to be at the bedside uh, continuously, right? Monitoring the quality of the data. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, otherwise, it's, it's it's. I mean, you can't just put it in and walk away and come up several hours later. The data is going to be not not very useful. I think this these are areas where we still need improvements. Now, if if you do that, and obviously this is only feasible as part of a of a pilot research project. But but if if you do that, I think you do get you do get adequate data, which does correlate well with invasive monitoring of brain tissue hypoxia, and 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 and, and other things like that. So 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 we are excited about this technology, although I think it's also fair to say that it's that it's pretty early days. Can you show the next slide after this? Because I think there was that's the one. Um... So what have you got there? I'm just sort of trying to right, absorb right. So, this. So, so this is a, and again, this was published by Arjun and, and his group several years ago. Uh, this is using uh, uh, indocyanin green, which is a uh, dye which is picked up by in, in the in the near infrared spectrum, right? So this is injected intravenously, right? And then we can monitor where the indocyanin green hits the brain, when the indocyanin yeah. green hits the, the the peripheral circulation, and this is a way to to quantify the DCS signal. Uh, right. So you're um, or or, or you're, to quantify the DCS signal. I was going to say it's a, it's really a calibration routine because exactly. you're using exactly yeah. it's, a, yeah. it's a calibration routine. Have you tried uh, cross-correlating? Uh, have you used the Hemidex, um, uh, uh, Fred Bowman's technology uh, in for any sort of comparison against? You know, uh, I, 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 I haven't. I haven't personally done that, but um, but but prior to my coming to Penn, uh, there 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 is some some work along those lines, and I believe there were a couple of publications, uh, not not very large number of subjects, but but that was done. And and as expected, there was a decent correlation. Not not perfect, but it was a decent correlation. Right. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I, I have another. Well, I'll email you. I think Ramon. I have another Absolutely. question Please. about something you do. I'll send. I'll send you an email. Thanks. Please email me. Absolutely. Very very. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for your questions. Oh, any anything else? Uh, that's all. For all right. Okay, I will go back to share. Um, so for today's project, um, Ramon and and was gracious enough to get us access to the Boost Two data, and um, we were talking with him and we're interested in kind of doing some, you know getting that data out and doing some kind of novel visualizations. And the first, one of the first ones we came up with was, well, you know, well, what does this, what does this data look like? We know it's very dynamic, um, but it's, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to get a sense of it just by looking at, you know, just by looking at waveforms. Um, it's kind of cool to have an animation that shows it. And um, we were interested in seeing how the different cohorts um um, you know, behaved and, and fared over the course of the treatment. So we came up with a, a visualization um, to do that, and we're going to share that with you today. Um, we started off, as we as I said, with um, the raw boost to CNS data. So there were about 125 patients of that. Um, it's a few hundred gig worth of data, um, and I, I was able to count data points yesterday. And it represents over 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 11 billion, almost 12 billion data points. Um, so it's kind of cool to look at a data set that's big. Honestly, this is one of the reasons that I got involved um, with um, with Dick Moberg in the first place was because I thought this was the, the, the coolest data set that I'd ever seen. Um, so part of our Connect platform is a client piece of software that will convert all of this um, CNS data into HDF5. And that makes it ready for MATLAB or for, or for you know ICM Plus or Python or R or whatever. And so we take this, we take the, um, we take the raw CNS data, and we just create, um, we create arrays of values, um, uh, modality values, and corresponding timestamps. So every, think of every, you know, every every modality ends up being a, a two by, 
you know, you know, million um, array of timestamps and, and values. So we've starting with that, um, it makes it a lot easier to work with in, in some of these data tools. Um, I like to develop things in, um, in Docker. And so uh, what I did is I just created a, a small Docker um, container that runs um, Python and Plotly and JupyterLab. And then I'm just able to um, to go at that from a machine, either you know either the same machine or another machine on the network. Um, uh, so there's a, a few. Um, it's it's really simple. I mean, that's just a Docker file and some some build files that go along with it, and then some some data extracts, um, some some data files that go along with it. So we've got two files. Um, one of them um, is um, the um, which study group the each patient was in. And then, um, and then the data itself. Um, watch your email um, for uh, uh, and watch your email for instructions on how to get the uh, the assets from today's webinar. Um, you will be provided with an ID and a password to access our demo site, and from there you will be able to go in, get the data, um, get the notebooks, get the Docker, um, the Docker files to to rebuild and uh, and recreate this on your on your own. Um, so let's stop sharing PowerPoint and share. Um, and share code. So this is the this is the notebook that um, that runs the animation. We'll jump right to the end, and then I'll kind of show you how we created it. So um, this is a, a, a um, basically a scatter plot. Um, in the upper left, um, are is um, represents um, ICP and PBTO two within range. So ICP. Um, um, below twenty two. And PBTO2 above above 20, um, and then the other, you know, this this quadrant over here um, is high ICP, um, but good PBTO2. Um, lower left is you know type C, what they call type C, that's good ICP and low PBTO2, and then type D is the uh, high ICP and low PBTO2. Um, and so what we do is we can um, set this graph in motion. Um, as patients move across and spend time in these zones, um, they, they grow in size. So when they, after they hit 60, um, 15 minutes, um, they grow to kind of this intermediate size after an hour, they grow to this larger size. Um, and so we really wanted a way to kind of show and demonstrate the dynamic nature of this. Uh, you know, it's everybody kind of knows has been told that you know you really can't just take an hourly meet reading, but I think seeing this um, this graph in motion um, drives that home, and you can see patients really do move around this graph. This graph. Um, also, uh, we were very interested in you know how how the two treatment groups um, looked on this graph, and you can see um, the where we're where we're where the study was you know not monitoring. Um, PBTO2, they are the, the the gray ones are the ones who are spending time in this lower half, which represents, you know, which represents that burden. Um, and so I think the first time we showed Ramon this, he was like, ah, I knew it. This is and it was kind of gratifying. I don't know if you have anything else um to say about about this, Ramon. Yeah, no, I thought this was really, really cool. It's a it's a nice way of of uh, you know visualizing this. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. And and, and I think obviously showing the the, the very the very significant effect you know that if you are if 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 the uh, PBO two data is visible to you and you're treating it in, in fact you, it it is possible to to prevent a lot of brain tissue hypoxia right there's clearly a big difference between the blue and the gray dots here cool. so this was actually I mean this is kind of the first um, the the very the very basic um, intro intro into just doing some visualization um the first thing we had to do um rather than run against um all all of the hdf5 data because and it's you know and it's 11 billion data points the first thing we the first thing we did is just um 
um, read the read the read the HDF five and just extracted the the ones we wanted um, and created a CSV out of it because this this takes quite a long time to run, and so um, running it over and over again was getting boring. And so what what uh, what I did is just created a, a a CSV with only the PBTO2 and ICP measurements, and so you end up with um, uh, um, and it calculated one minute means um, rather than the second by second. So it takes a it takes about thirty six um, million data points, um, calculates one minute means, and you end up with about a million um, about a million rows. And so that's the one that I used to to generate the graph the graph. Um, so starting off, um, you know, this typical, if, I don't know if, if there's probably, oh, I've got a question, sorry. Oh, it's already been answered. Okay. Um, you you know, importing the libraries that you need, um, you can, you can run OS level commands from a Python notebook here, just, you know, listing the, listing the different files. Um, the first thing I do is load the load that data into a pandas data frame um, and then just look at the you know look at the first five rows and so what that data looks like it's a million ish rows um, with a patient a modality a timestamp and then the value so it's very simple um, like I said it's about one million by four um, each patient you know the the top patients have about 25,000 um, rows and it goes on down from there um, the second thing we had to do is read in the study groups because they were not part of that the the um, HDF five data. So Ramon gave us uh, which study groups were in with patient. Um, so we just read those in as a two two la, or a, a two um, two column table, and then merge those with uh, with the um, with the ICP and PBTO two data. So what you end up with there is just um, you know the same same thing, and now you've got the the union or the um, the merge of those two data sets. Um, we want to graph this um, using both the ICP and PBTO2 values. And so we need to switch from um, this kind of column wise organization or this um, this column wise organization to a row wise or row wise organization. So we run a pivot and this is just like an Excel pivot. So there for, for each patient, for each timestamp, I've got um, the group and then the ICP and PBTO2 values um, next to each other. Um, you can see that these are, um, you know, floats um, and and dates. Um, I what I needed to do is synchronize all of the dates because these patients were um, uh, admitted, you know, all throughout the study. And so, uh, since I wanted them all in one one graph, I just had to translate the timestamps into a, a kind of a relative minute. And so, going through and calculating that data here. Um, just for the dis just for this um, display purposes, I didn't um, visualize all the data, so I just kind of took I took day three out of um, you know everybody's day three. I thought that was kind of a, a good um, you know midway point just to do the visualization with. Um, so we got rid of you know days one, two, and anything beyond three. Um, in some cases, um, you know, there was a minute where a, a patient was missing either or the ICP or PBO2. So I just dropped those, um, just drop them because th those end up as nulls when you do the merge. And so um, you can just drop those. Um, here, I just um, figured out which type, um, which type the, um, the patient was based on, based on the ranges. So types A, B, C, and D, uh, depending on what the, um, what the um, the values are. Um, this is a really slow function. Row wise functions are really slow in in Python, and so you can do something called vectorizing them, which turns them from these you know column wise call the function once for every row into a vector function, which calls the uh, which calls it once and passes the whole the whole vector of array. So it's much faster to do that. That you wait forever trying to do a a, a row a column or a row wise function like that. Um, so then what you get, um, you know, you you kind of keep building this out. We've got the the relative minutes here, and then what type it is. Um, I wanted to check and make sure I was doing, you know, whether that function was working correctly. So I did the the min and max um, by that type, and you can see like group A um, for the ICP is, you know, twenty two is the 
is the um, is the cutoff here for them going um, from between the groups, and then twenty on the um, on the PVTO two, just to kind of double check my work. Um, this was just a quick little piece of um, a, a line. Just if I just wanted to uh, test one one patient, um, so I'm just copying them over now, getting rid of the unneeded columns. And then I end up with, um, you know, with a, a, a smaller data frame. Next, um, I wanted to calculate how many minutes the person had been in that particular state. So because I wanted to um, make the little, the dot bigger or smaller, depending on, you know, how long they've been in that state. So there's kind of three, um, three, um, three tiers or three, um, three tiers within each quadrant. And so I'm just calculating, you know, if they go into type A, we reset it at, at zero minutes. Um, otherwise, if they're wandering around on the other, um, in the other um, quadrants of the graph, um, we, incre we, um, we increment, increment the, the time they've been there. Um, rename the columns so they look nicer in the graph um, when, you, when you do the hover over so they look like um, what, what we wanted to do. Um, and then we want to set that dot size um, depending on how long they've been in that state. So if they've been in between, um, if less than 15 minutes, it's a small dot. If they've been in um, over 15 minutes, but less than 60, it's a medium sized dot. Otherwise it's bigger. Um, then, um, um, so that's what those functions do. Then we run the functions. And now we've got, now we've kind of got the data set that we want to graph. Um, it turns out there's a bug in Plotly that I had to work around. Um, if the first group doesn't have both of these um, categories, it won't show that category. So what I ended up getting was, you know, only the um, only the only the ICP people or only the PBTO2 and ICP people, depending on um, which one was at the top of that that data frame. So I um, I just had to insert some dummy rows. Um, with dummy patients at the top of it. So um, that was a cute little bug to work around. Um, and then the, the the actual code to create the chart is pretty pretty simple and straightforward. It's well documented out in um, in the Plotly Express um, website. Um, they have a great gallery that you can go through and look at and decide, oh yeah, I want to do that one. And they have examples for you know for all the different um, um, you know, lettering and overlays with the lines and stuff like that. And so then, um, so then it comes up with the graph and, and that, and there we have it. Um, at the end, I, um, I saved off this, um, the, the data set that we use, that I used for the chart um, as, a, as another CDSV. So, you know, later on, I could just read that in and recreate the chart if I wanted to, rather than go through all the rigmarole. So that's kind of, that's kind of it. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, today was just meant to be kind of dip your toe into, um, you know, some basic um, how to run, how to run um, Plotly and Python um, on, you know, on a laptop if you wanted to. And, um, you know, do some, do some basic visualizations. I think we will, we'll start getting into um, prediction and kind of more complex things as the, as the, um, as the webinars, um, as we go through, um, but we just kind of wanted to start off with, you know, something super simple today. Um, let me see if I had anything else that we wanted to talk about today. Um, any, any questions or, um, you know, we're, if there's, you know, if you have your own data and want to get started, we'd love to, love to work with you. Um, if you have questions about this data, um, you know, that we, that we might be able to get Ramon's permission to answer using it. Um, he would, I'm sure he would be very generous and let us, let us do that. Um, so anything. I, I had a quick question uh, for sure. Ramon. Where, where are the outcomes stored currently? I don't think, I don't think we have access to that yet. We do. Uh, the the outcomes oh, from uh, Boost Two, yeah, I can give you those. Yes. You yeah, yeah, we've, okay. we've we've got them. Yeah. Um, we've got, I think there's six, never mind. Okay, six month six month goes as I think, right? Goes right, right. Yeah, yeah, we've got those in a in another data set. 
So cool. That's good to know. Thank yeah. you. I, mean, I was I was curious actually since we're still have more time. Um, Ramon, did they have um, a GCS or, or some some type of score on admittance as well? Yes, yes, we have that as well. I might like to get that too because I think that would be sure. really interesting to see that. Of course, yeah, because you showed that you showed that graph. Yeah, um, yeah, I would love to get those as well because I think um, Ethan and I were thinking about the um, we call them the Giza heat plots. I'm I'm sure there's. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's their official name, but there's some really there's some really cool um, visualizations that came out in a paper last I think it was last year last year early this year I think last year um, that showed some really really interesting visualizations and it would take I think we would need both um, both admit and dis and um, six months to 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 recreate those. That would be cool. I mean, I said that that, that little little visualization you saw it here of uh dots moving back and forth i think that's actually very instructive yeah and i wonder you know could you could you make a little movie file and and share that with me i'd love to show that at some of my talks absolutely 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 i can yeah. i can do that i will do that today so cool and um and for the participants don't forget um you should look for an email from us on how to access all of the assets um, so you could recreate this on your own or use it as a as a tutorial on your own. So I guess if there are no more questions, Greg, yeah, great. We got a question from Jeanette. Uh, oh. oh, I can read it aloud. Oh, she okay. said the existing visualization was created retrospectively. Are you considering building a similar visualization or version for prospective use, incorporating additional parameters for future use? Absolutely. Um, you know, part of the whole Connect platform is to um, you know make make this type of data and visualize this type of data you know in real time um, at you know in the clinic that's that's the I mean that's that's the goal of of our company and that's our reason for being is to get you know to get this kind of thing um, and where it can help help patients and we've got another question uh, hi Craig how how do we get in contact with you if you'd like to collaborate um right i'm, it's, I'm craig at moberg analytics um i will i will um my email was on one of the charts but i will paste it in the chat for you yeah i just i just sent your email oh okay cool yeah or also info um i think info at, at moberg mm -hmm. analytics we all get that one as well so All right. If there's nothing else, we will. Uh... We got a hand raise oh. from Anthony. I can bring him in to talk if you'd like. A lot of talk. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, quick question, uh, really in relation to the Boost Two data set. Um, Ramon may know the answer to this. Uh, I can see that the, the sort of thing you've just shown us, uh, Craig, is, is very promising. Uh, is there some way in which you can build into that sort of con comparison uh, features like uh, the actual pathology? Because you've got a huge variety of, I mean, the new buzzword is endotypes. And we've here we concentrate very much on people with a focal hematoma and raised pressure and needing a craniectomy. Um, it, does the Boost 2 uh, data set allow you to probe in and see how that relationship you've just been talking about between PBO2 and uh, um, uh, uh, ICP? Uh, can you then look at that same comparison in different endotypes? For example, patients with a hematoma or without a hematoma. Does, is, have you done that or is it feasible to do it? You know, that's a great question. Uh, we, we do have CT scans from these patients. They they haven't been comprehensively analyzed. I think we we did kind of a you know an initial view of the CT scan, sort of Marshall grading and, and yeah. et cetera. Right. Uh but but I you know I think that that could be worth doing, you know, particularly with newer AI tools that that can help uh measure 
contusion size, contusion location, things of that sort, like like blast CT or whatever. You know, here here in this side of the pond, we like to call them endophenotypes. This is a long-standing debate that I have with my good friend Dan, David Men. <laughs> but 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 it, I, I think it's getting the same concept. As far as I'm concerned, those two terms are synonymous. But but no, I think that's a criti critically important question. Now, you know, the boost two sample size was, was only 125 subjects. We had initially powered a study for 200, but the uh, we were we were told by the DSMB to stop early because we had met our our primary outcome. Right. I, I think obviously when the boost three data is available, that's going to be much higher quality data uh, and, and, and much more comprehensive. We do have CT reports on those. We we also, we attempted, we actually could not get the funding to actually have the scans themselves for boost three, but we certainly will have uh, the, the radiologist reports of the CTs, location of contusions, and, and and things like that. I think you raise a really important question. Right. It's a matter of, of sort of getting them into um, uh, well, I'm blocking on the term the uh, common data elements. Uh, exactly. I mean, right. Yeah, that, that's where if they can get them into common data elements, then it should not be a difficult job. Anyway, thank you very much. It's still, it's still a very, very data data rich setting, but 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 you're right. I think the uh, that, that that would be the first step. Thanks. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ramon. If there are other, you know, if there are other things, if what you know, if you know of data in the CRF or other, you know, Boost Two data that we can add to this and do some more interesting things to show, you know, and demonstrate, um, we would love we would love to do it. So. Um, Maybe you know, we we did, we did do Marshall Marshall uh, CT classification ratings on on all the boost two patients. Mm -hmm. Happy to send you that. I think the Marshall classification, uh, you know, leaves a lot to be desired, but it's at least something that's widely used in the field. Mm -hmm. um, sure, yeah, that, that would be kind of cool. Well, and th there's tons of off the shelf models for, you know detection and processing for CT images. So I'm sure that if you had the raw data, we could run it through something um, just to do a little bit of exploration that could actually serve as a good use case for a future webinar. Yeah, um, I've, I've done some image processing before in the past, but it would it'd be cool to revisit and, and use it as a you use know, case. You know, there, I, I, I don't know if you have become familiar with this program called Blast CT, which I believe was developed in Cambridge. It's sort of an AI tool that that it was, it, I mean, it huh. was a nice paper from uh, Virginia Newcomb and David Menon, where yeah. they, they used that in TBI, but it's also been used in other in other settings. I think uh, I I'm looking at it right now. Seems, yeah, seems to work pretty well. Yeah. So we could use that. <laughs> yeah, really pretty cool. easy. Yeah. 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 The more data we have, the more we can do. Yeah, and it's just so much fun. It's it's yeah. <laughs> it's our it's our whole reason. I I will have to see where the heck we have all those boost yeah. two CTs. Cool. Uh, I am pretty sure we have them all on CDs, but I'll have to dig around and see where they are. <laughs> That'd be awesome. That was quite a while ago when we finished that study. Yeah. Cool. Well, you know, it's it, it's great. I mean, because this the Boost 2 data, this Boost 2 data was just kind of sitting around. And I mean, so it's really fun to get it out and and breathe some new life into it using some of these some of these modern tools. It's just um it's just a blast. So it's cool. All right. Well, Ramon, I can't thank you enough for joining today. You, um, you it's just always, you're always so generous with your time. And we just well, love thank it. you guys so much for all your support. And there's a lot of exciting stuff coming down. So cool. Yeah. And right. yeah. Thank you to all of our Europeans for staying, um, staying late on a Friday. Um, we really appreciate it. And, um, we will um, we will talk to you on, or see you on the next webinar. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you all. Have a good one.